Thank you very much for coming tonight. It's our pleasure to welcome our honored guest. To paraphrase Daniel Webster, Dover is a small town, yet there are those of us who love it. And I think everybody in this room feels very strongly about our town and also feels very strongly about the woman who has done such an outstanding job representing us. Um, as a small town, it's such a pleasure to have somebody who takes a great interest in our activities and in our triumphs and in our trials. Uh, and I can't thank you enough for all the work you do for our town. And it's such a great pleasure to introduce you tonight. Thank you very much for coming. So I wanted to say good evening to everyone. Happy New Year to you. Thank you for coming out on a January evening. And before I begin, I'd like to speak about our most gracious moderator. Um, to paraphrase Daniel Frey's, um, Webster, Dover is a small town, and I love it. <laughs> and our moderator is extraordinary in his work. The best hallmark of democracy, I believe, is an open town meeting. But for an open town meeting to really function well, you need a moderator who is dedicated to the mission of the town meeting, both in his preparation and in the way he runs the town meeting, he or she runs the town meeting. You need the moderator to be fair in all the processes, and you need the moderator, hopefully, to be very humble and at times humorous with the members. And Dover has all of that in Jim Rapetti, all of that. And, and I want to say, Jim, personally, it's an honor to be introduced by you, so thank you. So we were going to start our evening um, with a presentation. I wanted you just to see this. You may all know that when you receive an email from me, the final signature says, yours in service, Denise Garlick. So tonight, as I give you this representative's report, you know how seriously I feel the responsibility of being your state representative. I thank you for asking me to do this job, and I'm here to report back to you, yours in service. This is our outline for how we'll handle our evening tonight. Anne will stop me at 8 o'clock, no matter where I am in the presentation, because the most important part of our evening is the questions and discussion. And let me introduce to you Anne Weinstein, who is my district director, Barry Hawk, who is legal counsel for the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery at the back of the room. I want to take a minute to reintroduce to you Amanda Bernardo, when we started this journey eight years ago, it was just Amanda and I um, working with the town of Dover, and I want you all to know that she is now the Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Elder Affairs of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And whenever I'm engaged in anything that um, takes a great deal of work and I need a great deal of support. I've got tremendous support in my family. And my husband Russell is here, my son Andy, and my daughter Beth. For those who do, are only meeting me for the first time tonight, I have just put up some of the positions that I have held since being elected your representative. Um, I would like you to know not only these positions in which I am now the chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, but I serve at the national level as well. And at the national level, I am the chair of the Health Public Policy Committee of the Council of State Governments. And I am also one of 24 people in the entire country who was named as an opioid fellow by the National Council of State Legislatures. I represent 40,000 people, a little bit more, every one of them near and dear to me. Um, 
In the Massachusetts Constitution, a representative represents by population on, but the towns must be contiguous by land or water. So I represent all of Needham, all of Dover, and half of Medfield. And I guess if anything ever happens to our roads, I'll canoe right up here. <laughs> the way I look at my responsibilities, and for those of you who have come to this report before, you know I use this triangle of the way I look at my responsibilities is my constituents are the top of the triangle, the highest need. Sometimes the constituents are individuals, sometimes they're organizations, and sometimes it is the town itself that is a constituent. And the tools that I use to work on my constituents' issues and concerns are both budget and legislation. And with the constituents, those concerns, the best tools I have are around advocacy and networking. I have always said to people, my secret power is that I can broker meetings. That when we are engaged in issues that are important, that are complicated, or we feel like we're just stalling, um, contact me immediately because I can get people into the room. I'm not sure I can get us all the results we want, but I can get people into the room, so I want you to know that. When I was thinking about how to do this presentation, I was thinking that I wanted to tell you just not what I do, but how I do it, so then any of the issues and concerns that are important to you, you'd know how I would begin to approach it and the information we would need to move something forward. So I believe that after this time, I'm beginning my, just finished my fourth term, beginning my fifth term, that I believe the formula that I best represent people is to listen, to learn, to lean in on issues, and to lead. And all of that is to obtain a positive impact. So how do I do that? How do I listen and learn? It certainly is about knowing my Dover neighbors, about understanding what our local issues are, and thinking about where the impact is. Where am I, what vehicle do I need? Do I need the budget? Do I need legislation? How do we move forward? So knowing our neighbors, number one, I want to thank Dover Cable Television. Rick is working hard. It's a new system for him. He has always been available. And Dover Television, I have done some shows with our young people up at the high school, is always accessible. So I thank them for that. These are the lists of people that I engage with in the ways that I can engage. And certainly one of the things that you know is my relationship with our moderator is that I attend every Dover town meeting. The best way to understand a town is to see what brings them to town meeting and what moves them to vote and how they mobilize their resources. I also want you to know that I am deeply committed to the young people in our town. And certainly when they come to the State House, I carve out time and prioritize that time with our scouts. Girl Scouts are coming, Boy Scouts are coming, and the school groups that come. I think a vitally important um, use of my time. I'm deeply concerned about our, how our young people perceive government and on those other issues, showing up at Dover Days, and all of the ways, heaven help us all, that we can now communicate in social media. Um, I am trying to actively engage in that and looking for input and feedback at all times. And in the town of Dover, I also deal with the municipal government in those official and formal routes of communication. I have great respect for our police chief and for our fire chief. And I know that we have an interim town administrator named Carl Valenti, who originally started in Needham. And though I never worked with him, I believe a lot of the foundation of good government was um, part of the work of Carl Valenti. So I look forward to working with him. So knowing that we need to look at the issues that matter in the community, so all of those ways in which I communicate, and now in this past year, um, having a campaign and having been in people's homes and at functions within the town and on people's doorsteps, if someone asked me that what were the values of the town of Dover, I would tell you that in listening and learning, I believe these are the values of our town of Dover. And it certainly is a sense of strong community. Even the pride that we talked about at the very beginning, a small town that we love. It is education and schools, which is a driving value in this town. And as we all know, the Dover Sherman School System ranks oftentimes first in the Commonwealth in their quality of education. 
There's a commitment to healthy youth that we see with all the people concerned with our young people, as well as healthy older adults. And there is an emerging and evolving sense of um, a commitment to Dover's water quality and its availability and its sustainability. Um, certainly transportation, we hear transportation's a big issue in the Commonwealth. It's a big issue in Dover too. Part of it is about the commuter rail where some Dover folks go to the junction in Needham and some folks go to Walpole. But in Dover it's a lot about traffic now and a discussion that we really have to have and around valuing open space and our rail trail and all the work that we're doing in that arena. So what does leading for impact mean? So what I'd like to do is just tell you two stories about what I think leading for impact means. And I thought it might be a way for you to understand um, how I approach the work that I'm doing and how I believe it can make an impact. The first story is very brief, and it's a local story about our water, and then I wanted to tell you another story that has a local impact as well as meeting our needs of the Commonwealth. So our local story is around the water, and there's water heroes sitting right in this audience. And you all might recall, I know we've got people from the planning board here, and we have people from the warrant committee here, that around 2014, 2015, there was a real discussion around the Springdale property sale, and there was a stream that went through that area. And Dover had a rising consciousness about what this might mean to the water availability and the water quality. And it was kind of at the same time that we were also discussions about every time we were digging a Dover well, it seemed we had to dig deeper for that well. And that was anecdotal information, but it was like, what is that really all about? And in 2015, um, our extraordinary former selectman, Carol Lisbon, as she was leaving her service on the board of selectmen, brought forward a motion that we should have a committee that would look at the water issue and um, in a water commission. And as the new board um, was constituted, there was a sense that the best um, group that could handle that information and could work on that initiative was the Board of Health. And we saw the Board of Health with incredible leadership from Jerry Clark that continues to this day take on the issue of water quality, availability, and sustainability in the town of Dover. So I'm listening very carefully. I'm following this discussion. I know this is an evolving issue in the town of Dover. The Board of Health, as we are going into a town meeting, there's a warrant article asking for money to get data and reports so that we can really wrap our arms around this issue, um, does public education sessions on the issues of water and quality and availability. And my staff, Anne, attends all of those sessions and debriefs me and with a real sense of how important this issue is in my office to the town of Dover. Um, the town meeting is in May of that year, and $150,000 are mobilized. Michael Rush, who is your state senator, wants to partner with the town on that issue and brings an amendment to the state budget for an additional $30,000. And this is really so that we can look at the records, we can get data, and the work that the Board of Health is doing is rooted in the data that we need to discuss this issue. Concurrent to that, I do have to confess to you that part of the need to go to the town of Dover and to the state for money was that the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, was not focused on this issue and could not be mobilized on this issue and told Jerry that they just couldn't focus on a town as small as Dover and they couldn't help us, so we took this job on ourselves. We got the money in the Senate amendment, but then to get money in the budget, you have to have it in the Senate and in the House. The House had already done their budget work, so I needed to work and negotiate and beg and plead to get it in the final state budget, and we did get that money in that final state budget. I show you that pie chart because I know that I'm just a slice of that pie. Mike Rush is a slice of that pie. And all the work of the townspeople and the town government made a difference. But this is extraordinary work that's going on in the town, and I'm glad to partner with it. The second story I wanted to tell you is the story about being the chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery. I was named the chair at the beginning of 2017. 
um, in March of 2017. We all know that our Commonwealth has an opioid epidemic and addiction in our Commonwealth is a public health crisis today. In 2017, the last time we have good data, 1,997 people in our Commonwealth died of an overdose from opioids. You know, we are losing almost five people a day in our Commonwealth, and we are working very hard on this issue, but this disease is relentless, and the disease of addiction and the opioid use is changing even as we're sitting here with the introduction of fentanyl into the market. In the Commonwealth, we measure we were measuring success by the number of overdose deaths. I would tell you as a registered nurse, I think we need a far better measurement than deaths. But even the small tick down that we've seen in the number of deaths is deceptive, I believe, because we've had the introduction of Narcan. Narcan is an opioid blocker. People die of overdose because it's depression of their respiratory system. The Narcan can block that. People breathe again. We need to get them to the emergency room. It can save their life. It's not a cure for the disease. So we have Narcan, we have the introduction of other drugs, and so this, with the, our commitment has to be steadfast and ongoing. My, co my committee received over 100 bills. Of the 100 bills that we received related to mental health, substance use, and recovery, there were 38 that directly related to the opioid issue. And I held those bills separate from the work that the rest of the committee was doing. In November of 2017, Governor Baker brought forward an opioid bill. And with his bill and the 38 bills that I had held on to, we started to draft an omnibus opioid bill. We needed to bring that bill out from November and brought it out on May 4th of 2018. I remember that day, it's my birthday. <laughs> we brought that bill out on May 4th. What did it take to bring out an ominous opioid bill? Number one, we had multiple public hearings on all of the other bills throughout the year. On this one bill that we were trying to draft on the opioid bill, they, it took uh, one public hearing alone on that bill that lasted for six and a half hours. This is the picture in Gardner Auditorium of that hearing. Um, the governor himself came and sat for 90 minutes and asked, answered questions from the committee on that issue. We reviewed over a thousand pages of documents and written testimony. We traveled as a committee from Fall River to Springfield to Franklin County and met with groups out in those areas around the work that they were doing, what they thought would work, where were the best practices, how we could move forward. We had more than 80 meetings with individual unique meetings. Many of those unique meetings we called people back in and interviewed them again and had further discussions on that bill. We brought that bill out um, on May 4th. It came to the House floor. And when it came to the House floor, I am pleased and honored to tell you that in a bipartisan fashion, the representatives and the, in my House of Representatives voted unanimously for that opioid bill. That bill then moved to the Senate. The Senate then took our work. They added things. They deleted things, just as we had done with the governor's bill. They brought their bill out. And then we had the month of July to negotiate that bill. And in fact, we had a pretty small window in that time. There's a rule in the House. When bills are negotiated between the House and the Senate, there's a conference committee. I get a call from the Speaker's office, and the Speaker says to me, we'd like you to be on the conference committee. This is a big deal. This is a big bill. I'm like, yes, that's a great thing. I want to be on this conference committee. He says, would like you to lead the conference committee. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. So I actually don't say anything. And then the, the answer is, well, are you saying yes, Denise? And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. I'm going, yes, that's an honor. Two hours later, the phone rings, and we have exceeded the time limits, not we the House, but the Senate had exceeded the time limits to constitute a conference committee. There will be no conference committee. And the Speaker says to me, just bring it home. Negotiate it with the Senate Chair and bring this bill home. 
and we began that really intense negotiations. And in fact, our negotiations continued day after day. We did one negotiation that lasted for 17 hours straight because I refused to leave the State House until there was agreement. And I said, listen, I have what I need in this bill. If there are things you want, you have to continue to negotiate because we cannot risk not having this bill done. And in fact, the opioid bill was voted on at about nine o'clock at night on July 31st, the last day of the session that you could vote it. It was voted unanimously in the House, unanimously in the Senate. It was signed by the governor and the governor signed that bill with no amendments at all. Extraordinary work. I want to share that work with you. I'm hoping you'll ask me questions about it. I've got a complete handout that is the master list of what that bill contained. That bill dealt with prevention, with strengthening and enhancing the behavioral health system, which we all know in the Commonwealth is nearly dysfunctional, and with the care and treatment of people that are individuals that are suffering and the families that are struggling and our communities that are straining with this opioid epidemic. So very pleased with that work. In a much more general way, I wanted to let you know, now listen, I want you to know <laughs> that not everyone in the town of Dover agrees with me on everything that I am doing. I know that. But with the people that I engage with, with the emails I get, with the people who do agree with me, and with the people who do not agree with me, I have a sense of what the values of our district are, and it, it dictates in many ways the way I will vote. The only time I wouldn't vote in a way that I believe reflects the needs of my district is a vote of conscience. And there are, um, that would be in very limited con um, circumstances in which we were talking about the death penalty or something like that. So to reflect the values of my district, I know the values were about women's rights and respecting choice. And I voted on the access bill and the pregnant workers fairness bill. And I won't read all of these to you, but I'll let you just take a look at that. I know that in our district, there is a strong sense of voters' rights and um, on the civil rights of all individuals. And I voted as a representative, you know, I voted twice on the transgender bill. I voted in the 2014-16 session, and then we went back and voted again on the public accommodations. The vote on the referendum was to reverse the vote um, that I took in the legislature, and that was defeated. So I certainly had voted on those twice before. And we can keep moving there. So I, I know that um, in our, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read off the computer as I'm talking to you. Um, our very strong value in our district is around voter rights and a real concern around voter suppression. And I know that from our discussion with our eighth graders. I want you to know that at the Dover Sherman School. And I was very pleased to vote on the civics education bill and on the automatic voter registration. I know how much our district cares about the issue of, um, so I, I have to confess to you that I'm wearing Russell's glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly, he has better vision than me um, around the criminal justice. So the criminal justice reform bill was a major bill that came before the House of Representatives. Because I was the chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery, I actually had great input on the sections that dealt with solitary confinement and on the definition of serious mental illness. And in addition to that, in the last session, I had worked with a Medfield High School student and two of her colleagues around the forensics related to rape kits and how long we kept that evidence and we weren't keeping it very long, I have to tell you. And I wasn't able to get that bill passed in the session before, but we got that language in the criminal justice reform bill. And in our district, we care very much about gun violence. And I heard that from the Mums Demand Action. I heard that at organizations I went to. I heard it from forums that I dealt with. And I voted both on the red flag bill and on the bump stock bill as well. And in our district, I want you to know there is a very strong, in our district, a very strong constituency around energy and the environment. 
and I certainly saw that and felt that in the last session, in forums I attended, in discussions that were going on, in um, people that came into the State House from my district on Lobby Day. And already in this session, I have been in session since January 2nd, the most overwhelming communication I'm getting in my office right now by phone and by email is around energy and the environment. If you just back up for a minute, Ann, I voted on those bills. Those were individual bills. I voted in the affirmative on those bills. And I just want the people who are deeply concerned about this issue, I share that sense of urgency. And I know that these bills are a good step, but many activists feel it wasn't a strong enough step. We will continue our work. We will continue our work. And um, of course, I have discussed with you the landmark opioid legislation. So in the bills that you're seeing um, for the new session coming up, I had a chance to share. I myself have sponsored 23 bills. We have a handout at the back of the bills that I've sponsored. Five of them I have sponsored um, directly related to requests from my constituents. Um, there are a total of 6,124 bills that have been filed for this session. We have passed the deadline for filing bills. There can still be late files, but that would be not so many. And I am currently in the two-week two period around co-sponsoring. To co-sponsor a bill, um, I haven't co-sponsored anything till I get to Thursday. I've got notebooks of 6,124 bills. I'm very thoughtful about the number of bills I co-sponsor because I actually weigh in on the bills that I co-sponsor. And um, I try to keep that number between 150 and 200. On the issues to watch, these are the issues that all the news is telling us to watch. I will tell you as insider information here tonight, it's going to be education and health care. Those are the two major issues we're looking at moving ahead. And on the budget, you know, the, I would just want you to know that the budget money is not only the money. I'm going to ask you for five extra minutes because I started five minutes late and I apologize for that. But on the budget, right, the budget money that, we, that the town of Dover taxpayers contribute to the state, um, some of it directly comes back to Dover, but most of it is in our state agencies, our Office of Elder Affairs, the Department of Public Health, Mass Health, the Department of Developmental Services, the Economic Development for the Commonwealth. That all contributes to our quality of life. We talked about the money for the town of Dover. And in the Dover budget, these are just the highlights. The Chapter 70 money is the money that comes directly to the town for education. And you'll see that increase from FY18 to FY19. When I negotiate this spring, I will be negotiating on the FY20 budget. So this is the money that we currently have received. Um, Dover means the Chickering School. Dover Sherbin means our middle school and our high school. The special education circuit breaker, which Bob and I have discussed for years, you'll see that that money from FY18 to FY19 doesn't change on this chart. That's because it's money that's reimbursed back to the town on a formula. We don't have that final number yet, but it depends on the number of students and the intensity of services that they need. But what did happen, the state in the last two years underestimated the special education circuit breaker and we voted additional money in the supplemental budget. I will always advocate for that for personal reasons, for professional reasons, for the needs of my town. I will always advocate for that special education circuit money. And this, the unrestricted, it's UGGA, it's the unrestricted general government aid. We call it local aid because the other way is too difficult. This is the money that comes back to the town that the town chooses how to use. Oftentimes it's used on public safety and other issues like that. We see an increase there for Dover. And the Chapter 90 money, which I was having a heart attack about because it looks like we've dropped money, it's a $733,000 difference. What that is, is it 1,000? 733. 7,003, no, it's $733. Yeah, $733, but still, that's a tiny amount, but I was concerned that the optics on that don't look good. That's also based on a formula. It's the number of the people in town, the number of miles in the town, and how close businesses are to the proximity of the town. It's on a formula, it really doesn't change except for that really small difference there, which is less than $1,000. I wanted to end with you 
on the issues of Massachusetts strengths. There is not a morning that I wake up that I don't read the globe, check my email, and worry for my towns, and worry for my state, and worry for my country. And there's not a night that I go to bed that I don't put my head on that pillow and thank God I live in Massachusetts. We've got a lot to be proud of. I hope you're proud of the things that we're doing. Whether we're talking about our public education, we rank number one. We're talking about our services to our veterans. We are a leader in the life sciences. We, have, we are the number one state in clean energy jobs in the nation. So our work, we continue with our work. And I hope you share that pride. And I hope you share with me the real commitment to the work also goes on. Lots of work to do. I wanted to share with you, I'm proud of Massachusetts. I want you to be proud of me. And these are awards and acknowledgments that I have received. And um, they're very meaningful to me. I'm telling you, when these groups organize you for work that you've been doing that really people don't see, you can't demonstrate to the people at home, it makes a difference. And nobody, nobody, nobody does this job alone. I don't do this job alone. I do it with you. I do it with our town government, and I do it with caucuses of state legislators who come together, and the constellation changes. You know, the, the person who isn't with you on the um, Metro West Caucus might well be with you on the Manufacturing Caucus, and the representatives work together to advance an agenda, and I'm always mindful that it takes a lot of people to move any issue. So that's how to contact me. And I hope you feel like you can do it. This is the website, and we're working hard to make sure that's timely and informative for you. And this is my family. I introduced some of them to you. I've got more where they came from, and I've got a brand new grandson. Yeah. Thank you. And we can just leave that picture up. Thank you. So this time belongs to you in whichever way you'd like to use it, any questions you'd like to ask, any discussion you'd like to have. As the planning board members are leaving, I want to thank you very much for attending the presentation tonight. So let's talk about things that might be on your mind, or trust me, I got a million stories for you. Yes. Great. You, you know what, can I just ask you, can you come to the mic? So. Rick can hear you well. Okay, right there. So my question for you is, I know that you work in the opioid epidemic. Yes. In the state house. So I do a lot of work with my, and I go into the city. Yes. And sometimes I actually go in with my daughter and we hand out like gloves and it's the homeless, sometimes we are in the area where the Greater Boston Food Bank is, where there's a high opioid usage area right. and I noticed a couple times when I've gone in with my daughter or with myself there is needles on the floor to the point where I literally I am concerned that either <coughs> I myself was going to get sick or my daughter's going to get sick just walking within that Let's grab this. so my question to you is as far as I know right now yeah people can access safe needles my concern is those needles are ending up on the ground so my question is, we, is there something in the new bill or something that in order to be put in to have the people that are using a safe place to shoot where they could go and shoot and also dispose of the needles so they are not within the sidewalk or walking areas to the rest of the public? So, so the, the question is, certainly around the number of people in certain areas of the city that are um, using needles, they're injecting heroin. Um, I actually have toured that whole area. It's down in the new market area in Boston. And um, several things have happened down there. So number one is they've set up what is essentially a day shelter. Many of these individuals are homeless and the rules of the shelter is they need to be out early in the morning and they can't return until late in the day. So now they've set up a day shelter where people can congregate together, um, certainly in this cold weather, but there's food available throughout the day, it's warm, and there's counselors available. So I'm hoping that's helpful. 
I share your concern about the needles. I was on a playground in that area and there were needles in the Bach mulch um, in the playground. In the omnibus opioid bill, we have increased the number of um, needles for safety exchange. So that makes a difference that people are using clean needles. So um, one of the things you're asking is about the safe injection facilities. Well, the needles, again, the needles, but they're dropping. Right, right. So there's a lot of discussion about harm reduction and how we move forward. So um, one of the things in the bill, too, is it sets up a commission called the Medication Assistant, um, Medication Assisted Treatment Commission. And it's about how we're going to be able to get people who need medication-assisted treatment, how we're going to make sure that throughout the Commonwealth people can do that. We have some areas that are very densely service-oriented and lots of people are there. We have deserts out in the Berkshires where no one can get care and treatment at all. So we're hoping to kind of smooth out that process and make that behavioral health system work better. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. Oh, I was waiting for you. Start. Let's start with exactly the comparable situation, but not discarding needles. But walking around this town, as I had the opportunity to in late December, literally walking 30 miles around the town, mm -hmm. you, you cannot believe the number of these small little devices that you first mistake to be USB sticks, only to discover that they are, in fact, vape devices, e cigarettes. So the board of health here is moving toward the uh, regulation of vape cigarettes as much as, of course, our two retail stores that sell these products, or don't, in fact, neither one currently sells these. But I would hope that the state would take action on these products because the FDA uh, pulled a fast one at everyone when they went ahead and gloriously eliminated menthol in cigarettes. But of course, the whole point of the base is that they are flavored so they are attractive to children. And I would hope the state would take action on that regarding, because statistics I see suggest that we're heading back up to 40% utilization among young people, which is horrific because that was the peak for cigarettes. And they are just as dangerous, perhaps, more so. Uh, another topic, uh, I'm curious, uh, when Becca Roche of Needham um, bested Senator Ross of Natick, one particular bill that he had in there, you and I have discussed, and it's of, I think, great interest to Dover, uh, there were a series of bills, his among them, that were filed, and no action has yet been taken, on providing for mitigation, reducing the effects of Chapter 40 in comprehensive permit, so as to allow the municipality to be able to consider the environmental platform that these developments would sit on. Do you have sufficient capacity for traffic? Do you have sufficient sewage? Do you have the capacity for water? Right now, Sherborne has been going through hamstrings trying to figure out how to dump a 120 unit facility in the center of Sherborne. And of course, they're facing the same type of question. And I would hope that further action is taken in the next legislature. There were numerous bills filed. No action really went forward. Those legislators who are within the greater Boston area, frankly, have no understanding at all, you know, from Cambridge or Somerville or Boston, they can't understand. Why can't you just put up 30 million slides again? <laughs> and it's an education process that I, I do think some of the Metro West legislators really should take on. Uh, I don't expect that we'll see movement this year. There's no current new bill file as far as I know. Uh, separate topic, of course. <laughs> no, I mean, you've got health issues here. Uh, you filed the state action for health performance. What, superior health performance, I think right. it's called? And I'm just wondering where you see that going. I mean, it was 
as I understand it, intended to strengthen the hand of those health facilities and municipalities. One place that no one seems to care much about, but we will when it happens here in this area, is the dramatic increase of parents who choose to believe that vaccinations are more at risk for their children than are the diseases that the vaccinations prevent. And therefore, we seem to gloss over the fact that we lost 80,000 people last year to flu disease. 80,000 people to so that disease. So I'm going to take these questions in reverse order, if it's good. And I want you to know, um, this is the reason why I respect and admire Jerry Clark so much. His, he thinks about a variety of issues, and he thinks about these issues deeply and thoroughly. And your Board of Health is growing in strength every single day. In reverse order, the bill that I'm the sponsor. So when you are the sponsor of the bill, you own that bill. And the people who co-sponsor it come on that bill to help move that bill forward. But the bill that Jerry is referring to is a bill that I have co-sponsored with Hannah Kane, who is a Republican. And we've done this very purposely. This is one of the most important bills that we can bring forward that will never be a headline, but is a bureaucratic way to strengthen our boards of health. The boards of health in the Commonwealth, there's 351 cities and towns. There's 351 boards of health. Some are very strong. Some are getting stronger, and some are very weak. And there has been a commission that it was called to look at all of these issues and not to mandate that the boards of health join together and to in any way do that because I personally don't want to dilute the power of the boards of health that are strong. But it sets up avenues and ways for the boards of health to begin to write memorandums of understanding together, to join together in resources. So if Dover is very strong on the water issue and Medfield is very strong on suicide prevention and mental health issues, that the boards can more easily work with each other. This is a very important bill. And it leads us to the other two issues that you were discussing. So the second issue that you were talking about around 40B is affordable housing. And what Jerry is, is highlighting, and I share this sense, there is a very strong need for housing in the Commonwealth. We all know that. And in our town of Dover, people who are trying to age in place that aren't sure if they can stay here and where do they go and how will they go, that's a major, major concern. But there is also a concern out in our areas, particularly once people have reached the 10% of um, affordable housing, around the capacity of the towns to be able to deliver services if we continue to do this kind of building. In the town of Needham, there are 700 rental units coming on in this one year um, in the town. You know, in Medfield, they're looking at major development at that Medfield State Hospital property. It is wise to try and figure out what your capacity is around public safety, around public health, and around those issues. So I, I did not know whether or not anyone picked up Senator Ross's legislation. I'll check that out for sure. But we do have to be mindful of what the individual towns can do once they've reached their affordable housing limit. Um, and how much further they can go. The third issue that Jerry was talking about was the issue around vaping. Now this is an issue that some people may know about, some people may just be learning about. This is an issue that, let me tell you, is happening at the middle school and at the high school right here in Dover. Um, the work that we have done at the state level is this year I voted for no tobacco sales to anyone under the age of 21. That includes e-cigarettes. It's going to um, be um, make a difference in the way that the, the cigarettes and the vaping materials, anything that is available in retail establishments. The other issue around the menthol and the mint, this is a real issue and a real concern. The town of Needham just voted last week to ban the sales of any products with menthol and mint in it. This is important because what we find, with a, particularly with our young people, their, their access to materials, whatever those materials are, whether it's cigarettes or it's um, these jewels or um, you know, when, they're, when they're vaping, their access makes a difference to the number of people that are using this. 
any avenue that we can cut off to access is a positive step forward to protect our young people. So perhaps the Dover Board of Health will think about banning the sale of menthol and mint products in the town of Dover as well. And we will continue to address this issue. One of the things, when I talk about energy and the environment, one of the, it took me, when I say that I listen and learn, I had to learn about energy and the environment. I mean, I, I understood what was the whole issue around climate disruption and what was happening. I, I understood it on an intellectual level. But there's more acronyms and, and um, terms in energy and environment that's really, really hard to wrap your mind around. And I needed people to teach me about that. But the way I came to my position and being as strong in my position on energy and the environment is around the issue of environmental justice. Because I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse my whole life. Once I could connect public health to energy and the environment, it all became seamless for me and I saw why these things were important and how to do that. All those issues that you're talking about, Jerry, you know, the affordable um, housing issue, right? We can make the case around environmental justice for that and the impact on public health. Vaping is public health. You know, the, the, we have to support the people who are engaged in health and human services. You'll find that it will have more to do with your quality of life that you can't even begin to put your finger on on a day-to-day -day basis, and it is probably the smallest part of our town budget. So the support we can give and the way we can strengthen these boards of health across the Commonwealth, I believe is going to make a difference. I'm very proud of, I'm, I, this is such a bureaucratic bill. I am just so pleased that you saw it and you know how important it is. So thanks. As, as our selectman, John Jeffries, says, he reads everything. Uh, I, I try to end so, so if the two of you have a little time, I'm trying to read 6,127 bills. <laughs> Come on over. Any other thoughts or questions? How are we doing on time here? We have five more minutes. We have five more minutes. So I want to tell you um, how pleased I am. This was a big jump for us tonight because traditionally we have sent a postcard to every single household in the town of Dover to invite people to the representative's report. And I want to thank Ann who put together a whole campaign for us so that we, through social media, through the groups and organizations you belong through, through the print media, that we were reaching out um, to people as much as we could. I thank every person who's here. I thank the people that are going to watch it on television. And I want to say, you know, there's, there's always a moment where people will say, oh, it's an honor and privilege to be your representative. I hear people say it all the time, right? I want you to know that when I say it, I mean it from my heart. It is an honor and a privilege to be the representative for the town of Dover. It is an honor and privilege to serve in public service in our Commonwealth. And um, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for your support. My family thanks you for all the support you give me. So good night.